thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon. Um, and uh, first of all, I just want to say how pleased we are at USAID um, with the results of this, uh, you know, little more than a year-long collaboration with, uh, with the Overseas Development Institute. Um, as Jonathan has indicated, uh, they produced four uh, very uh, thoughtful papers, one of them over 100 pages long. So there's a lot of good material in there that they, there's no way that we could uh, really dive into today. But I, you know, it's all online and I encourage people uh, to, uh, to uh, delve into it. Um, I would like to try to do two things in the time that I have. One of them is to just to provide you a little bit of context about why it was that we uh, look to ODI to provide this research support and then to talk about a couple of specific of the couple, several of the specific findings that have had particular resonance and are shaping the way that we're going to be moving forward on it. Uh, I don't know how many of you over here in on this side of the pond are familiar with USAID Forward, but this was essentially the name that was given to a set of reforms uh, that were given uh, by the uh, our current uh, USAID administrator, uh, Dr. Rajiv Shah. Um, um, to describe essentially several things that he wanted to do to sort of elevate uh, USAID's practice. And one of the things that they focused on was uh, what we were calling at the time implementation and procurement reform. But it was very much trying to say that we do want to move in the direction of, of localizing aid, providing more direct funding to governments, to the civil society, to the private sector, and uh, that um, we needed to change the way that we were, uh, the mechanisms and, and the guidance that we had around them so that we could actually make that easier to do. So that's how we, and we also attached to it a, a fairly um, ambitious objective uh, that over a five year period we would move from about 9% of this being a localized aid to about 30%. So by the end of, of our fiscal year 2015. So we've been, we've been working on, 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 on this and we've been making some progress and there's, in fact, if you go to the USA.gov website, there's a fairly extensive report on the USAID reforms, including where we are on this uh, IPR. But I think that one of the things that, uh, since I come from the Policy Bureau, we felt was really important was to uh, embed this uh, focus on Im Im improving the mechanisms for doing it with a policy direction and a set of operational guidance that would sort of say, well, under what context does it make sense to do this? How should we be thinking about it? And so one of the things that we felt was really important as we did that was to, to understand the existing level of experience um, and evidence that we could draw on and, and use as a foundation. And we felt that given that European uh, organizations were further along in some respects of this, particularly in terms of generalized budget support, who better than, say, ODI uh, to help us essentially collect this information? So uh, that was one of the reasons that we uh, looked uh, over here for uh, that kind of su research support. Um, even though we were seeking the support, we already had an idea about the direction that we wanted to go. And it's alluded to in the last paper talking about this whole of society approach. But the terminology that we've sort of uh, settled on it within USAID is a local systems approach, um, which seems to go well with localized aid. Um, what we mean by a localized uh, systems approach is a sort of essentially sort of operating from the standpoint that what does it take to produce any kind of a development result that you care about? Well, it takes essentially the, the efforts of multiple actors working sometimes together, sometimes not so well together, but it includes government, it includes civil society, includes individual citizens, to some extent in some cases the private sector as well. And that in order for you to be able to sustain those results over time, those actors need to be able to work effectively to, with one another in order to produce those results in the first instance and then to be able to sustain them. That collection of local actors is what we call a local system. And so to some extent, obviously, there are, as Jonathan has already alluded to, there are lots of different ways that you can support local systems with development finance. But clearly, localized aid, direct uh, provision of funding to one or no more of those actors is clearly an important part of it. And indeed, 
uh, we feel an increasingly, for, uh, for us, an increasingly important part. So that was essentially the direction that we wanted to go. So we are in the final stages of, uh, of, final of, uh, of drafting this, uh, this policy. Uh, we will essentially, before we make it uh, permanent, we will be making it public, and any of you here, um, either physically or online, will be welcome to, to comment on it when we, uh, when we do it, which should be within the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, but there are four basic uh, pieces of the research that I wanted to focus on that have been helpful in terms of shaping the way we are approaching this work on localized aid. And not surprisingly, I picked one from every one of the reports. Um, so one of them is this question about what is the status of Busan? <laughs> And um, I think that one of the things, I mean, it, it, the, I have to say that I've, I really, really felt that the, 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 the assembly of the critiques and the examination of the evolution of thinking around aid effectiveness from before Paris, through Paris, to Accra, to Busan, is really one of the most, I think, one of the best pieces of, of the whole bunch, frankly. But, um, but I think that one of the things that, that was assuring, reassuring to us was the fact that this focus on localized aid in particular and more generally is focused on local, on local systems was in fact entirely consistent with the agenda that was set out in Busan. So I think that to some extent, I think when they hear, when, when perhaps some of our partners are going to hear us talking about local systems, one of the things they're going to say is, are you really being true to what you've signed up to at Paris? And I think that based on this re re research, I think we can more convincingly make points about the fact that we are entirely being consistent with what Busan has been saying about inclusive, you know, in, be, being development being more inclusive and making sure that in fact the civil society and private sector and individuals and so forth are at the table and part of the process. So that was one I think that was been very helpful. The second one was actually sort of a negative finding, which is that in the second study, which even though it's 100 pages long, I think that one of the things that took us a little bit by surprise was just how little evidence there actually was. And uh, they've done their best to collect the, the existing evaluations and so forth. Um, and, uh, but I think we were sort of anticipating that the level of insight and knowledge um, was going to be a little bit more grounded in some tougher research than it really has been. And I think that the conclusion that we've come to at USAID about this is how important it is as we move forward and I can't speak for any other donors, but I think this message should apply to them as well, um, uh, is essentially that we need, we need to make sure that as we are advancing with this localized aid effort, that we are doing so in a very thoughtful way so that we are actually collecting good evidence as we go. Part of it is, I think, to reassure ourselves that, this, that the findings that they've alluded to about how important and useful it is are in fact true, but I think also part of it is uh, uh, to learn from these things and to sort of make sure that we are tailoring localized aid in the appropriate processes. Um, a third finding, I think, which uh, again really speaks to this question about risk. And I mean, I th it's not, I mean, we've been very interested in this question around risk and we've been happy, you know, pleased that uh, the research team also picked up on this question of risk. It's really important. I mean, um, to us, the real issue comes down to it's, it's, that we, we all produce marvelous uh, statements of policy and intent. We have lots of very um, inspiring words, but oftentimes they don't ever get implemented and the question always to me is why? And we're trying to anticipate in our policy what, what may be some of the aspects of our current environment that are creating it, making, that make it difficult for us to move with this agenda. And this question around risk is really one of them because it is sort of the, 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 the established sort of um, conventional wisdom that localized aid is more risky. But it is only more risky, as Alice there was, was talking about, if all you're focusing in on is the fiduciary risk part of it. And I think that certainly one of the ways to begin to having a more productive conversation about this is by splitting up and understanding that there are these broader risks and more importantly that oftentimes there's a hydraulic going on between programmatic risk on the one hand and the fiduciary risk on the other and so i think part of what so we've we've at least recognized that in our in our policy uh, to some extent, uh, as an agency with, with, uh, regulator with regulations and so forth that are uh, placed upon us, 
we don't entirely control our own destiny on this. We need to have conversations with uh, other parts about how do we have a more nuanced and sophisticated conversation around risks. And I think the other part of it is, is that sort of recognizing that it's not just about risks, it's also about rewards. And so part of the issue is, is that we, we tend to have this negative conversation about how do we avoid risks, but I think it always is, you know, if you think about how the private sector goes about it, they're also talking about the, as, as investors, they're talking about what's the upside gain, what's the reward that we get from putting some money at risk in this case. And it's a balancing, balancing here. And so I think one of the things that we need to do a better job is articulating and putting perhaps even numerical values on the gains to be had from making certain kinds of choices so that we have a much more accurate, almost sort of actuarial kind of a calculation about the benefits and the costs of making various kinds of choices. And the last one, um, in some ways the most complicated one, is the, comes out of the fourth report about internalizing complexity. Uh, I'm personally particularly pleased that Jonathan and company have picked up on this because I was yammering on them about this from the very beginning and at first I was getting nothing but uh, blank stares uh, about why I thought there was a connection between localized aid and complexity, but I'm, I'm personally pleased that um, they've uh, seized on it. But I, I think this, this challenge, and I, it's interesting to see that there is sort of a renewed conversation going on in the blogosphere right now around complexity and about its application to development and so forth that comes every couple of years. But the point here is, is that I, I think that one of the conclusions is, is that it doesn't work particularly well to sort of come in with sort of armed with all of this, uh, si you know, complex systems speak and, and so forth. So the question is, how do you begin to integrate an attention to complexity without overwhelming people with kind of an overly academic kind of an approach? And I think that the, the, the research already gives you some indications and we are trying to sort of uh, be consistent with that by sort of addressing this in a, in a light touch. But clearly it has to do with things like how do you ensure uh, that the system has uh, forms of ad adaptability built into it. And actually one of the things that we, we've concluded is that adaptability, the ability to sort of recognize this change in the li larger environment, are really uh, tied to accountability because it's this question about holding people accountable that allows the messages to say, well, the situation is changing. What worked last year or what worked the season before isn't currently working. We need to make some kinds of adjustments. And so I think that one of the things that we're at least emphasizing in this, res in this uh, policy is again about the importance of accountability, but also I think partly in terms of how it helps systems become more adaptable and, and, and more resilient. But as I, uh, just to conclude, I, again, I think this has been a marvelous uh, piece of work and a wonderful collaboration, and I commend to you uh, looking at this uh, work uh, a little bit more deeply because it's, uh, it's full of um, uh, very interesting insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we've had lots of food for thought and really useful to have insights in terms of how you're actually taking on board some of the findings within within your agency, so thank you for that. We have about 45 minutes for questions and reflections from you, and so I'll try to take a couple if I can and then come back to the panel. Yes, um, and if you could just wait for a microphone and say who you are before you ask your Hi, question. Hi, my name is Quinn Zimmerman. I'm a postgrad student at King's College in the War Studies Department. You were just talking, Mr. Walker, about risk, financial risk, and some of the issues around that for donors, but in the slide that Mr. McKechnie showed, they were showing that yes, the risk is a little bit higher with localized aid, but the cost also seems to be significantly less, and you also have potentially greater gains in, in overall effectiveness. Is this something that donors maybe are willing to take into consideration? Yes, there might be a little bit more risk in what is lost financially, but given it costs quite a bit less to begin with, is that something that maybe donors are willing to be okay with? Yes. Would anyone else like to come in at this point um, on that issue or something else that struck them? No? Um, okay. We hand over to you for the moment and then let people think about their other questions. Sure. So, uh, I, I mean, I think that, I think that, the, that the kind of graph that Alastair produced is sort of the is a helpful sort of step in the, in the direction. I mean, I think that what it does is it shows a sense of trade-offs. Um, I think that w two things about it. I mean, there are, s as, as the paper talks about, there are actually more dimensions of risk 
uh, going on than just the ones that are shown on that graph. But obviously, it's harder to show multiple dimensions. So I think that 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 kind of a that kind of an analytical approach, of sort of looking at these various sort of polygons and, and how they shake out is useful. But I think, again, what would be even more helpful would be to move from kind of the hypothesized set of what, these, what you think these relationships are to actual putting some, some values on what these things are. So if we could actually begin to put, you know, that those, that those uh, dimensions would actually have numbers attached to them, I think those would be really quite powerful. And I think that one of the things, for example, that we've been thinking about is, is particularly about about the programmatic risks and about what happens to projects after they have come to an end and what happens to the sustainability of those results, because I think that I think that uh, we have a hypothesis that that the results what happens after them is not per per particularly pretty, but we don't have an awful lot of evidence. So one of the things that we're committing ourselves to is develop is, is running a series of ex post evaluations going back to a selected set of projects three to five years after they've, complete, they've been completed to examine what has been the history here. And you know, depending on how we do it, we may be able to get some insight into this about how effective localized versus non-localized aid has been in terms of being able to sustain them, as well as beginning to get some insight as to the relative costs of not doing it, because you can actually see what's happened and attach some value to it. And Anna said, do you want to comment briefly? I know I cut you off a bit on your slides earlier, but thoughts on how you might want to take, take some of this further? Yeah, I, I agree very much with what Chip said, that we really need um, hard numbers and, um, and, and, and evidence coming from e evaluation of, um, of, of projects and programs in, in, in particular. And I think... Um, that's that's part of it. I think th there are also, I think, quite complicated political issues, which I, th I think Chip would be the first to um, to, to mention to to deal with. I mean, for for, for one thing, um, most politicians face, uh, depending on the country, a two to five year electoral cycle, and everybody. And I don't know what the half life of different ministers is. I mean, it's probably two or three. Um, Years, and 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 you know, if you're a minister, you want to be able to demonstrate some results and you've achieved something. Yet we know from the research, I mean, take the World Bank 2011 World Development Report, that the kind of institutional changes that underpin um, sustainability that enable countries to stand on their own feet can take 20, 30 years under favourable circumstances. So there's a there's a real mismatch. There and and uh, you know you don't sort of blame um, politicians necessarily uh, because you know they face incentives like um, li like everyone else. I, I think too um, there's there's a, there's a there's a difference um, in in perceptions of risk, say between the private sector where many of these politicians come from. I mean people accept that there are risks, but there are also rewards. These kind of trade offs. Um, trade-offs get made, but for some reason in the development business, that's not considered, um, you know, that's not considered wise. Uh, I think another set of um, of, of risks is, is is how much do you let recipient governments, recipient um, agencies, actors within the country take decisions on how the money is spent. Now, in, in every industrialized countries, we know that budget decisions are a set of political trade-offs that, that various constituencies have to be placated and, and rewarded and so on. But then, then imposing rather technocratic um, budget choices on developing countries where they have much greater risks of that the country could descend into armed violence and chaos and there are you know, constituencies that need to be rewarded and so on. That, for example, seems hard for many people to grasp. So I think there's a real issue in how those of us who are working in development communicate some of these ideas to um, the public um, and to the people who they elect to, to represent them. Mm -hmm. Thank you.